On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated while on a visit to Dallas, Texas. He was traveling in a motorcade on his way from the airport to a luncheon, and as he was passing the Texas School Book Depository, shots were fired and the president was hit. But how many shots? Three or four? Was it a lone assassin, or was there a second gunman? In an interview for IEEE TV, IEEE member Charles Rader takes us back to the controversy surrounding the assassination and the initial investigation by the Warren Commission. Let me begin with the point of view that, that came from the, the Warren Commission, which was an investigation, a panel that was put together to kind of review what the FBI said had happened and, and make an official report. And they came to the conclusion that the assassination was done by a man named Lee Harvey Oswald, who was the lone assassin acting alone. He fired, according to the Warren Commission, three times. The first bullet injured the president, but didn't do anything serious, any serious damage. The second shot missed, and the third shot basically hit him in the skull and killed him. There were all kinds of people who questioned whether there were other shots. One of the persistent questions was whether there was a shot fired from a spot called the Grassy Knoll, which was just to the right of the motorcade. Lots of people said that they thought they heard shots coming from that direction. And of course that would imply a second person somebody still out there who did this terrible thing 40 years ago. By the mid-1970s, Congress responded to the continuing controversy over the assassination by establishing the House Select Committee on Assassinations to look into the evidence, particularly the fourth bullet theory. The committee decided to investigate the police radio recordings from that day to see whether they could hear gunshots. Now, there were two channels uh, of police radio in Dallas. One was devoted to the motorcade and one was devoted to routine police business. And they were, both channels were recorded in a push to talk, stop when there's no carrier mode. So this, they're not continuous recordings. They're basically silence separated by brief bursts of, of transmission. Somewhere in Dallas, as luck would have it, there was a motorcycle whose push to talk button was stuck in the transmit position for something like five or six minutes that included the time of the assassination. If the motorcycle with the stuck button were in the motorcade and if it were turned to the wrong channel, the channel that recorded the police business by mistake, it could have picked up gunshots. So why not listen to that recording, see if you can hear gunshots, and if you're lucky, you could count gunshots. If you hear more than three, you've got important new evidence. The committee hired a team of experts at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. The team thought they could distinguish gunshot sounds from other sounds by identifying echo patterns. They traveled to Texas and set up microphones at numerous locations along the roadway in Dealey Plaza. For each microphone, they recorded the impulse pattern for a gunshot fired from Oswald's presumed location and another for a gunshot fired from the so-called grassy knoll. These recordings served as a collection of possible predicted patterns or templates they actually made this huge long strip chart of the recording made in 1963. And for each template, they slid it along looking for a match where they had pulses in the template matching peaks in the waveform. They said, maybe this is interesting. And they computed a correlation coefficient and they decided an interesting correlation coefficient was when the, the formula on this chart becomes more than 0.5. They actually found 15 such matches, but they had four reasonable matches, which 
They can call four gunshots, four, I'm going to use the word putative gunshots. What Barger did and his team did is make a very interesting plot. They, the vertical axis on this plot is time running down from the top. And the horizontal axis is microphone number or microphone position along the motorcade route. The motorcycle would have changed position between shots, so you would expect that if you'd recorded some number of shots, they would lie along a straight line in this plot. And you can pretty much rule out the, the ones that, they, that they've marked off by X's, and you're left with four times and about four reasonable positions. This also tells you where the motorcycle would have to be. Barger's team was confident that if the Dictabelt had recorded any gunshots, the only possible gunshots were these four, and they estimated a probability of 50% for candidate C. The shooter location for C was the grassy knoll. The shooter location for A, B, and D was Oswald's location. The Congressional Committee was determined to get a more conclusive result, so they hired Mark Weiss and Ernest Ashkenazi, a team from Queens College, to engage in more acoustical studies. But they worked only on a part of the strip chart. They only looked at the so-called third shot, the grassy knoll shot. And they figured out a combination of a shooter position, a microphone position, speed of sound, they even took the microphone velocity into account, and the speed of, of which this uh, recording was being made, the device called the Dictabelt. And they identified a combination of these parameters that let them match 13 impulses that they predicted with 11 peaks in the recording. And they calculated a 95% a confidence of their identifications. Right away you can find some problems with their confidence because the shot, the, the, the piece of the record that they identified as a shot was one that was about 200 milliseconds earlier than the Barger team at BB&N had found. They, had, they basically put the putative sh third shot at something that hadn't even survived Barger's team screening procedure. Uh, but nevertheless, Barger looked at what they'd done and said, hmm, seems right. So the ball bounced into the court of the Justice Department. If Weiss and Ashkenazi were correct, there needed to be an ongoing investigation for an unsolved crime. If the FBI was correct, the case would remain closed. So you've got one set of experts saying Tweedledum and one set of experts seeing Tweedledee. You need more experts. So the Justice Department asked the National Academy of Engineering to put together a committee. Headed by Norman Ramsey of Harvard University, the committee was composed of a number of Nobel Prize winners and well-known experts in statistics, firearms, physics, instrumentation, and in the case of Raider, signal processing. Called the Committee on Ballistic Acoustics, an obscure name chosen to keep assassination fanatics from hounding the members with various theories, its mission was to analyze and critique the methodology of the previous researchers. It didn't work. They, they f some of the assassination buffs found us, and it's a good thing that they did because the, the crucial part of our work came from a hint from an assassination buff. There was this young man from Shelby, Ohio, a rock musician named Steve Barber, who contacted Chairman Ramsey and said that he could hear a sound on this Channel R, the recording that had been analyzed for the gunshots, which had originated on Channel M, the motorcade channel. And it's Sheriff Ta Decker saying, hold everything secure until the homicide and other investigators can get there. And this is clearly after the assassination by something like a minute. Now, 
If you listen to that sound on Channel M, the motorcycle, the motorcade channel, it's unmistakable. If you listen to it on the Dicta Belt recording that, that's supposed to have the gunshots, you can't hear it saying that unless you have a really trained ear like Barber. Or unless somebody tells you what it says, and then you can hear it. Clearly, if Barber's hypothesis is right, it's not a gunshot, it's speech. So whether he's right or not is of crucial importance, utterly crucial importance. One of the first things I had done when I got a copy of uh, this Dick DeBelt recording is I'd made a speech spectrogram. And it looked to me like speech, completely unintelligible, but it looked like speech. Once we had the barber suggestion of what speech it was, we made two speech spectrograms, lined them up one next to the other and compared them. And as you can see from the slide, there are a lot of points of similarity. The two recording devices were not running at exactly the same recording speed. When you correct for the recording speed, it's a bit of simple mathematics, that you also shift the frequencies on the sound spectrogram. And the correction that makes for the best fit also makes the frequencies fit best. So it's really very good evidence that the, uh, the sounds have the same source. Well, this still, sleep, still leaves you with a great big open question. How on earth did sound that was transmitted on the motorcade channel find its way onto the routine police business channel? Uh, a little later down the recording, there's a phrase that we call the Stemmons phrase. It's a policeman on the motorcade channel saying, do you want me to hold this traffic on Stemmons, et cetera, et cetera. And you can hear that on the other channel as well. This is several minutes later. And it's unmistakable. There's no psychoacoustics here. I mean, you don't need to be told what it is. You can hear that it's the same. So you've really nailed down that there is crosstalk from one channel to the other. That still leaves the question of how it got there. And here we don't have this astronomical certainty of, of how it got there, but we have a pretty reasonable hypothesis. A few miles north of Dealey Plaza, there's a place called the Dallas Trade Mart. And in the basement of the Dallas Trade Mart, there was a police staging area. And there was a loudspeaker mounted on a pillar in this underground staging area. And the loudspeaker was broadcasting Channel M, the motorcade channel. And we think that the stuck button motorcycle was in the underground garage, uh, abandoned by the motorcycle policeman uh, while he had a drink or smoke or whatever. And we think that it picked up the sounds in that underground garage, which included the sounds from the loudspeaker, which were being broadcast on channel M. There's an interesting bit of other data on the Dictabelt tape that lends credibility to that hypothesis. Several minutes after the assassination, there are siren sounds. And the sirens approach. You can tell they're approaching because there's a Doppler shift, which makes them seem higher pitched, and they're getting louder. And then they suddenly switch to lower pitch and begin to get lower, indicating that they're going away. So the, the motorcade creating these, these siren sounds is approaching, passing, and moving away. So this is not you know, astronomical proof, but it's, it seems reasonable. At least it's 
It's a working hypothesis. The committee wrote a draft report and they showed their work to the previous two committees for their suggestions and blessings, which they received. Our findings were actually very well received by a community of interesting people. Uh, the original researchers, Barger and company, uh, pretty much agreed with what we'd done. And many of the assassination buff community in their various meetings and newsletters and correspondence seemed to agree that we discredited the acoustical evidence. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody agrees and there's still ongoing, there's still a group of people who think we were wrong. There are even people who think we were in on the conspiracy, but not many. Charles Rader is but one of thousands of people who have studied some aspect of President Kennedy's death. Despite the finality of official government reports substantiating the three bullets, one gunman theory, thousands more remain skeptical and continue to question.